Okay, well, these are my disclosures. So I thought we can um, divide them in two types of challenges. So we have on one side the technical challenges related to the anatomy, and on the other side there are uh, patient-related challenges. So on the technical side, we have the difficult anatomy. So for any transcatheter mitral valve uh, replacement therapies, you know, we're just dealing with a more complex uh, valve anatomy. So the size of the, of the valve, the shape, the interaction with the LVOT angles, and all the other things that you already know, that plus in MAC is a lot more uh, difficult. Another important technical challenge is that we do not have a transcatheter heart valve designed for MAC. So because of the lack of that device, we need to adapt the use of existing devices and mostly has been up to date right now would be the aortic transcatheter heart valves and just early experience with some transcatheter um, mitral devices. So sizing is another challenge. So sizing of the mitral annulus in the presence of severe MAC is very difficult. Uh, there's no universal method. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the CT sizing in a moment. Anchoring for balloon expandable valves is uh, very challenging because we rely on the calcium only. So we are limited by the amount and distribution of calcium and factors that we'll discuss. And LVOT obstruction obviously is the Achilles heel of this procedure. And on the patient related side, so we have the age. Most of these patients are old and often frail with a lot of comorbidities with sometimes multivalvular pathology, and sometimes there's severe TR, there's RV dysfunction, there are other factors that it doesn't matter how beautiful result you have on the mitral side. Those patients are not going to do well long term. And the LV cavity is often small in patients with MAC, and therefore they're predisposed or they have higher risk of TNVR-induced LVOT obstruction. And we need to keep in mind that uh, those patients may be cohort C, so uh, we should stay uh, away from those. Now, within the technical challenges, I think there are uh, some related to balloon expandable technology and some related to the self-expandable technology. So for the balloon expandable sizing, as we mentioned, uh, the risk of paravalvular leak because of the oval shape, and we have mostly round devices, so the risk of paravalvular leak may be higher uh, sometimes. Um, anchoring, uh, very difficult if you don't have an anchoring um, mechanism within the valve and the LVOT obstruction that we'll discuss in a moment. And for self-expandable, there are a lot of unknowns, you know, the experiences early uh, with the transcatheter mitral devices that are self-expandable, but one potential um, challenge will be that you may not achieve full expansion of the device due to uh, restrictions related to the presence of calcium. Uh, can you have paravalvular leak if your valve is underexpanded? And also the risk of LVOT obstruction like in the other one. Now, sizing methods, uh, there are different. Uh, I think CT is definitely the most uh, important one, and there are different methods. So we started with manual tracings using the standard softwares, and now lately they have been um, commercially available uh, devices, I'm sorry, uh, softwares like the Trimencio package or circle imaging. I think the one thing we agree on is that the T-shape methodology uh, gives you the less uh, variability between observers. So uh, most of us are using the D-shape. We try to trace the inner edge. Uh, sometimes this is from Didi. She likes to go a little bit on the inside to account for the blooming artifact, you know, because sometimes you know, she doesn't want to undersize because that can lead to embolization. And it's important to measure both in systole and diastole. So we learned that also we really need the entire cardiac uh, uh, cycle, or all the phases of the cardiac cycle. Sometimes, uh, most of the times, it's larger in systole, but sometimes you know it can be larger in another phase. So it's important to look at all of them. And once you are done with your uh, sizing, then. Um, we need to choose a transcatheter valve. Now, I'm talking now a balloon expandable valve. Uh, we extrapolated what we have learned from the tower experience, so we based uh, the transcatheter device based on area. We need to oversize as in tower or more, so don't be shy oversizing. Uh, there hasn't been a single case of annular rupture reported, reported in the registry in more than 100 cases. If someone knows of one, please let me know, because that would be a very, very important concept. So. Uh, if in between the two sizes, you know, try to go with a larger one because it, undersized valves, we do know that even with proper technique, they do embolize to the left atrium. So anchoring a balloon expandable a valve is, um, is challenging. So there are factors that can uh, contribute, like the amount and the distribution of calcium. We know that we do need anterior calcium or, or trigon uh, involvement to uh, help with uh, anchoring. Uh, when we don't have this anterior involvement, there's higher risk of embolization. Uh, the calcium thickness is important, and I uh, don't know what the thickness uh, you'll be. I think it's a multifactorial, excuse me, a multifactorial, you're not gonna 
come down to one number and say, oh, you have five millimeters, that should be enough. It's multifactorial, but if it's very thin, then we need to be careful. And as I mentioned, we had to oversize and always flare in the left ventricle. Don't leave the cath lab unless you flare or at least know deep in your heart that you tried everything you could to flare. If you cannot flare, then that, you know, there's not much you can do. But uh, add extra volume from the get-go, from the beginning. We prepared these devices with extra volume. We, um, before, we were deploying a nominal and then pulse dilating. We realized, you know you had to flare, so what's the point in doing two inflations? Just add the extra volume and then deploy. So you do two in one. That saves you one pace and run, and you can use that for later uh, farther post, like post dilatation if that's needed. Um, aim for a final position 80% in the left ventricle because these valves are going to embolize to the left atrium, so it's better to stay uh, more in the left ventricle uh, to allow for that uh, movement. Now, the other challenge, or the most important challenge that I think we have is uh, LVOT obstruction. And in order to deal with that, we need to learn to predict it so that we can prevent it and, we, and treat it. These are just examples of measurements of the annular area, uh, placing our virtual valve and measuring at this level. So we cut a slice this way. You're looking at this uh, like a slice now with a neo, uh, or neo LVOT measuring like almost zero. So this, this will be very small and will result in, in severe LVOT obstruction. So the mechanism is a permanent anterior displacement of the anterior leaflet, and there are multiple risk factors like the basal septal hypertrophy, a narrow LVOT space, a small LV cavity that tends to be the case in MAC patients, particularly with mitral stenosis and not MR, a long and calcified anterior leaflet, uh, the orthomitral angle, the length or height of the transcatheter heart valve device that you are uh, using, and also the position of the transcatheter heart valve in relation to the annulus, the more ventricular, then the more uh, space in the LVOT that you're going to occupy. And I think it's multifactorial, and it's a combination of all those factors. Um, and thanks to the work uh, from Philip Blanke and Jonathan Leipzig and Vancouver, we have learned to predict those LVOT dimensions so that they came up with the concept of the neo LVOT, where you measure, you, you measure the, you place your virtual valve, then remove it and measure the LVOT space without the valve, put that new valve, and now remeasure the space, and that remaining space is the neo LVOT. And this is just another example of their publications. And Didi, now this is work from Didi one from Henry Ford. So she has done work and uh, analyzed uh, some of our patients in the registry in the trial that uh, ended up having LVOT obstruction and tried to compare with those who didn't to try to determine what is the safety neo LVOT cutoff at which you do not see LVOT obstruction. So we know that a neo LVOT of 250 millimeters squared or larger is not associated with LVOT obstruction. Anything below that, you may have a different or a variety of degrees of LVOT obstruction. And now we need to work on defining what is the minimum that you can have before you have hemodynamically significant LVOT obstruction. And we don't know that number yet. Um, we uh, learn uh, how to treat uh, acute LVOT uh, obstruction, and alcohol septal ablation has been one of those strategies. Uh, this is uh, at baseline, this is after TMVR, and this is after alcohol ablation where the gradient was virtually eliminated. That was the first uh, case. Um, there have been other techniques like uh, the use of Evolute uh, uh, valve uh, to treat um, uh, TMVR induced LVOT obstruction. This was a TMVR uh, in a valve in ring case. I haven't done one of those. So at, well, our strategy has been alcohol septal ablation, and we um, published a series of cases where six patients were treated with bailout strategy for hemodynamically significant. We're not just treating everybody. This is someone with hemodynamically significant LVOT obstruction. There was reduction in LVOT grading in all six cases, but in one of them, it came back You know, the following day. One patient died. Uh, of the multi-organ failure three weeks later and one of AV block, but four were discharged from the hospital, and those are the uh, tracings, uh, these are posts. So it, um, it does work. And I want to show this case. This is the one that had the recurrent LVOT gradient. So this is a baseline. This is post-DMVR, and after ablation, it got much better. Uh, the patient was hemodynamically stable overnight, but the next day, the gradient came back, and on echo, our echo doctors told us there was a septal edema from, from the, you know, the rebound effect that you may see sometimes. So we had to bring the patient back, remove the transcatheter valve, resect the anterior leaflet, and do a transatrial TMVR, and then there was no grading after that. 
But um, I think that was a game-changing uh, event. Uh, we learned a lot. We learned that the, rest, the, the response to alcohol septal ablation may be unpredictable. So even though it may work in most patients, uh, we don't know when it's going to come back the following day. So that gave us the concept that maybe preemptive alcohol septal ablation performed weeks prior to TNVR may be a more predictable um, uh, way to uh, prepare this patient. So, and since then, we have changed from bailout strategy to preemptive, and since we have not had any more uh, uh, LVOT obstruction or death related to that. So we have treated at least 10 patients successfully with uh, TMDR, uh, patients who were at high risk of LVOT obstruction, and uh, will now receive a valve uh, without having uh, a gradient. Uh, this is the latest one uh, from six weeks ago at Evanston Hospital. This is after ablation. You can see it's almost like a surgical mm -hmm. result of myectomy. And now our measurements with a virtual valve now having enough room I think I have one that shows you before and after. So this is a CT before and this is after. So the septum a lot thinner and less contractile. And these are the measurements. So this is the before, so almost 19 millimeter septal thickness there. This is after, right at the base, exactly where we need it. This is the neo LVOT before, 170, so kind of in the gray zone, or perhaps you know high risk enough. And the neo LVOT of 250 after alcohol ablation, and a neo LVOT area index of 150. I, I don't know yet what the cutoff would be for an area index, but I'm starting to looking at those. And this is the deployment six weeks ago. So this is a 29 uh, sapien 3, uh, now fully deployed and absolutely zero LVOT gradient. Um, this is a CT post, and I want to pause here because look, looking back four years ago, uh, since this month is the fourth anniversary of our first uh, percutaneous uh, TMVR in MAC, uh, to, to be able to get the CT, predict who's at, who's at risk of LVOT obstruction, do something about it, prevent it, and furthermore, put your virtual valve and be able to place your new valve and compare side by side and be able to place the valve exactly where you want it without a beauty obstruction. I think this is to me, wow, like a really big difference between now and four years ago where we didn't know any of this. So um, good achievement. Now, Sometimes it's futile. We think that some patients are not going to benefit from uh, alcohol ablation, and we do surgical resection of the anterior leaflet for those patients. Uh, but obviously, it's an invasive procedure, and some patients are not good candidates. And I think Adam is going to talk. I see him in the audience. I think he's going to talk about this later this afternoon. So I'm just going to say that there's a percutaneous uh, option as well. So in conclusion, uh, TMVR in MAC with the balloon expandable transcatheter heart valve is challenging. Uh, anchoring and LVOT obstruction are the most important limitations. Uh, new transcatheter heart valve designs may reduce the LVOT obstruction risk and improve anchoring. If LVOT obstruction occurs, it can be treated in selected patients with alcohol ablation. But more importantly, LVOT obstruction can be prevented. Uh, septal ablation weeks prior to TMVR is one of the strategies surgical anterior leaflet resection during a transatrial TMVR may be a good option for good surgical candidates, or percutaneous anterior leaflet laceration with the lampoon procedure may be an option as well. Now, what we need is to develop a percutaneous solution for anchoring, so if you have any ideas for this, please call me. Thank you. Hats off to you, Myra, for really leading the way in this four years ago. Thank it's you, Adam. Really you may amazing. remember that day. Yeah. It was August of 2013, so yeah. exactly four years ago. Hats off. I, I wonder, you know, the TMVR uh, feasibility studies that are ongoing right now have developed, you know, an unfortunate reputation for having a significant number of screen failures. And I just wonder how much of that would change if we started doing preemptive alcohol subtoblation and then sending them for screening. Do you think you have any sense as to... As to how that would affect uh, patients who screen out because of neo LVOT mm -hmm. for tendine or intrepid or cardiac use? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, if we start using this um, like a adjunctive therapy, mm -hmm. there may be other patients. I mean, if they truly have no other options, and uh, I think we need to go back and look at the look at the neo LVOT space of those. Mm -hmm. If uh, the uh, the difference between um, between a, a successful or a good new LVOT is small, like sometimes there are some futile cases, like mm -hmm. the ones that I will show you, we don't think that alcohol ablation mm -hmm. is going to help everybody, but there are some borderline cases, and I think we know 250 or more is, is good. We mm -hmm. don't really know for sure. I don't know if it's 180 or 190 or 200 or what 70. What is it? the really maximum threshold 
that the, the law is that you cannot cross. So there's a gray zone. If you have someone in a gray zone and, and has a, a favorable anatomy for alcohol septal ablation and you're trying to decide with, with versus doing something, trying something in, or, or not at all, I think it may, uh, it may be reasonable to try alcohol ablation, repeat the CT scan, and, uh, and reevaluate. Re and particularly useful if you have a retrievable device. Myra, how many of these patients have multivalvular disease? I ask because we've had some patient post have with MAC, mm -hmm. and they get a little better, and you wonder, do they need to go on? And it's very hard to assess mm -hmm. the, the, the need. It's certainly now we're entering a, a period of time where it's kind of like incomplete revascularization versus complete. I don't know, we have mm -hmm. to come up with a new term, incomplete valve the therapy. Valve. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So in the registry, which we're going to talk about it later this afternoon, uh, out of more than 100 patients, 52% have prior AVR. Wow. So yeah. it's, those are patients who were allowed to survive the, the, the aortic valve pathology. They have replacement, and now they live long enough to now develop uh, mitral calcification and uh, um, you know, they, they have a valve disease that is already treated. Some, the now there are some that are coming to us with uh, both untreated aortic stenosis and also MAC. And there are some case reports where people have treated both in the same session. That's not something that uh, we would do. I think the risk may be too high. So maybe perhaps treating the aortic pathology for which you have an approved device and good outcomes, do that first and then reevaluate the options for the mitral valve. But uh, we, that's what we do. We treat uh, the aortic device, I mean, the aortic pathology, bring the patient back in 30 days. If the patient is still having symptoms, despite a successful TAVR, and you do have mitral valve pathology and options for that, then we reinitiate the evaluation now for the mitral therapy. It is interesting, Mara. As you know, Rob Smith is leading her whole cycle yeah. revolution uh -huh. with that. And uh, we have now done three patients where he feels like uh, whenever they have such severe dual valve disease, he's reluctant to get them out of the hospital. So we'll usually do those in the same hospital setting, mm -hmm. but at different times, not at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, uh, aortic first and, mm -hmm. and then figure out how to get mm -hmm. the other one in place. And, and when you're right. talking same aortic percutaneous followed by a transatrial TMVR, because the citral trial is a surgical transatrial right. he, and he's only. Do, he's doing the citral uh -huh. surgical the piece center. after uh -huh. that, right? Okay. So that he can control that without uh -huh. impingement. Yeah, that, that's the difference between uh, percutaneous one right. because it's still, it's less predictable the type of result that we want to have. And um, if it's unpredictable and you're going to have an unstable patient, I would rather have an unstable patient that no longer has aortic pathology and right. we just wait, you know, after 30 days. Yeah, and so I think that's also uh, mixing very Can well I ask a question? Sure. What do you do with tricuspid regurgitation in the citral trial? Uh, do you take, do you add a tricuspid uh, repair? Can I answer that actually? So we're <laughs> 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 We've done, uh, I think, five off-label uh, citrals can take some time to do some regulations, but mm -hmm. it's not a transatrial approach. It's a port access to the right chest, so it's on pump, like uh, a lot of mitral surgeons do in terms of direct visual to access. And with the citral trial, we can perform a fibrillation as well as common tricuspid repair, as a lot of these patients need. Mm -hmm. But the, the key difference is, is that because we're directly looking at the valve, there's a couple other adjuncts. One is we cut out a little bit of A2 uh, to prevent alcohol tract obstruction. And I'm not sure if in the central trial it's allowed or not, but certainly I've done, I'm sure Rob's done it also, where we cut out some of the septum because you're looking mm -hmm. directly at it. Yes. Uh, so we perform a septum And then the other thing we can do is we put, I, I do this, I don't know if Rob does it in every case, I put a felt uh, strip in the landing zone. Put a few sutures and put a uh, felt strip, and then when we deploy the valve, that's another buttress mm -hmm. to try to prevent her valve bleeding. So, at least in, in my experience, and thinking Rob's as well, Rob's I think done about a dozen, I think five, and I, I mean, we see very minimal her valve bleeding on alpha track construction. It's still surgery, it's still, you know, it's a million basis, so there's it's a lot more for the patient to recover. So, there's going to be some patient selection versus a purely percutaneous approach. And then getting back to your point, David, about the same hospitalization, we are on the, um, the, the, the downside of that decision not to do someone like that in the same hospitalization. We want to have on somebody, send her home with a goal in about a month when the aortic valve is a little more sucked in, you know, to do a, a right chest approach. And she came back in 
significant heart failure this week, uh, and now it's like you, you can spit on her and she'll die. So I mean, I'm not sure if she'll get to the point of a, of a uh, transcatheter valve replacement, whether it's through a surgical approach or a percutaneous approach. So I would also concur, at least in that end of one, and your experience, it is probably smarter to do the same setting, particularly if they got that in that. Just, just in a, a couple notes. Yes, uh, he, he does like felt, and uh, I think that's been a key part of it. Two, um, as you know, uh, arguing arguing with Rob is not fruitful, uh, and so we probably did avoid a couple. <laughs> I know exactly what what you're talking about. Uh, and in the in the problem with that a little bit is our hospital president is not thrilled with the DRG that comes out of those events whenever we do it in the same hospitalization. Yes, so you can imagine, understand that. Yeah. Uh, however, your, you know, your, your case story just points out, you know, the balance of those two things. And right now, much like early days of TAVR, we're certainly eating dollars for, you know, what we're trying to do across the board with those things. And then uh, finally, I think, you know, uh, Rob did a robotic uh, piece of this, I think, is the first robotic one done as well, uh, less invasively. John. Myra, can you comment a little about your strategy for the preemptive alcohol supplementation? You don't have the typical... Mm -hmm. Gradients follow. It's a little bit of a, you know, yep. kind of a blind procedure. That, that, so speak, exactly. Right? So that's a good point. Some of them actually, I have had a couple who already had a gradient. And it's interesting. It's a gradient, a multifactorial, you know, uh, etiology of gradient because of the septal thickness and the calcium in the anterior leaflet. And uh, for those that are a lot easier. But when there's no gradient, uh, we aim for about uh, anywhere between 1 to 2 mL of uh, alcohol and watching the conduction. And we start seeing conduct conduction problems and we pause and uh, uh, at least one, but we, you know, we aim for two amounts of, of alcohol. But you're right, uh, we have the pigtail or whatever catheter you want to check the gradient, actually a halo uh, catheter, that's what I use most of the times, but uh, you don't really rely on, on the gradient like you do for Hocum patients. So it's a little bit blind. We watch the enzymes go up and down, and we just you know, hope that. We look at the echo, and we just wait six to eight weeks for the follow-up uh, CT, and uh, there is improvement in, in most of the ones that have treated. I think I have heard of a couple where it didn't work. And in one case, I think the conclusion was that it wasn't alcohol that was injected. So I think the enzymes also kind of, you know, didn't go. And, uh, you know, that's unofficially from another institution. And uh, uh, most of the times uh, it has worked, but in carefully selected patients, you know, with the right anatomy, with the right septal thickness, with um, enough and, and neo LVOT space that you think that you're going to achieve what you need. You know, if it's already too small and it's looking like almost like zero, then I, I don't know that it will work for those patients.